everyone. My name is Marenika Giwa Onawu, and I want to thank you for coming to our panel here at the Neurodiversity Matters Conference on issues related to intersectionality for um, those of us who are neurodivergent and BIPOC. I am really pleased to have an amazing group of panelists here with you all. I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves, you know, a little bit about themselves, how they identify their pronouns, and we'll kind of start off with that. Um, and then we'll go on to some questions and dialogue that we have. Um, and so to model, you know, the standard, um, my name is Marena Kegiwa Onaiwu. My pronouns are, are she, her, hers, and they, them, theirs. Um, I identify as um, a Black woman, um, specifically Yoruba and Cabo Verdeano. Um, so of West African descent, but I live here um, in the United States where I was primarily raised. Um, I am autistic as well as a person, uh, I have ADHD as well, and giftedness and some psychiatric disability and part of a really big, loud, neurodivergent family. So my um, wonderful panelists have, are, can go in any order. We've got um, Mario, Tara, and Jay, and I will allow them to introduce themselves. Don't everybody rush at once. <laughs> right? well, Jay, sounds like you want to go first then. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right, my name's Jay Walker. My pronouns are he, him, his. And uh, I am an actor and a writer and a producer here in Rhode Island. I am uh, recently discovering let's put it that way, that I am on the autistic spectrum and uh, have other neurodivergent issues as well. And uh, I don't, I'm not really sure what else to say. <laughs> okay. No, you can say whatever it is that you like. Awesome. Who would like to go next? Yeah, I'll go. So he's Shay Tericho, Chief Godos. Hello, everyone. My name is Tara Moses. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm calling in for the Muskogee Creek Reservation, as well as the site of the 1921 burning of Black Wall Street. These lands mm -hmm. are also the traditional lands of the Osage and Cotto. So to say, Oklahoma is a very complicated place. Mm -hmm. um, and speaking of complicated, my identity. Um, I am a citizen of the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma, as well as Muskogee Creek. I'm a director, a playwright, an artistic director, a uh, co-founder of Grandmother Arts, many multi-hyphenates, um, and I also choose to identify as neurodivergent. Um, after a recent diagnosis of ADHD and in the process of more diagnoses, um, right now so it's very exciting we'll see anyway i have some suspicions uh but with that <laughs> thanks i'll throw it over to mario whenever you're ready oh thank you uh, well hi everyone i'm uh, mario gomez uh my pronouns are he him i'm uh dialing in from a providence from a right now from a town called providence rhode island who that is either in the traditional land of the uh, narragansett I identify as a Latinx uh, cisgender man, as an, also as an immigrant with a dual citizenship between uh, both Mexico and the uh, United States. I also identify as a, a white passing person of color. And uh, also, I have, from a long, long time, uh, had suspicions that I am a uh, somewhere in the autism spectrum as a my neurodivergence and i'm actually in the process of uh working with uh, uh doctors and uh mental health professionals on seeing uh, i'm seeking a uh, diagnosis an official diagnosis so y'all are making this really easy for me because actually the next thing that i was going to have us talk about after we let everyone know who we are was to talk a little bit about our diagnosis story whether it's still in flux or whether it has occurred because as you know diagnosis is a complicated issue for everyone especially for those of us who are bipoc you know and neurodivergent especially for adults 
Um, and we know that they're, it, depending upon where one lives, because a lot of people still think that a lot of these conditions, so whether it's ADHD, autism, or so many things, um, tend to think that, oh, it's just small children who have these things. And so there are some people who don't realize how it might present differently, depending upon our cultural background, depending upon the compensatory strategies that we um, developed. So I think about myself, um, I was given a diagnosis of major depression um, when I was in sixth grade, um, because I had a suicide journal in sixth, um, sixth and seventh grade, I was, had a lot of, but I was gifted. So they just thought all of us gifted kids were kind of weird. So um, the autism wasn't picked up until after my children's diagnosis. My ADHD diagnosis wasn't picked up until, um, you know, grad school. And I actually, before I formally got the autism diagnosis, I self-diagnosed. And I know some people, um, you know, it's safer to self-diagnose as opposed to um, going for a formal diagnosis because of discrimination or cost or access or a number of, of, of barriers that can be. So I'd love to hear, I know a lot of you have shared about how you've suspected this or you think this, are you checking this out? It'd be really cool to hear um, you share about how did this all kind of get started? What kicked it off? Like for me, it was just an accident. A provider said, have you ever gotten, you know, evaluated? And I'm like, no. And they're like, but you're just like these kids who are on the spectrum. What's the deal? Yeah, so for me, someone had to point it out to me. Um, <laughs> but what was your journey? And I'd love to hear from anyone who'd like to get started. Cool. Well, I mean, since I was uh, the last one to uh, bring it up, I guess I'll just uh, continue that uh, path. Yeah, and also I felt uh, very identified with what you were saying about uh, being a kid that uh, felt like gifted or that was uh, more studious, more, you know, I don't want to say the word gifted because that would be applying it to myself. But uh, yeah, there were certain things that definitely growing up, I think I was on the slightly uh, quieter, more awkward, weird side of uh, being a kid. And it was always uh, actually one of the things that uh, years later, a friend of, uh, I'm the mom of a one of my childhood friends uh, mentioned that really stuck with me was that, uh, uh, that I always seemed to be with everyone, but with no one at the same time when we were part of the group. So it was always like me in my own little world while still trying to reach out and then of course, being a, a kid like that, uh, I made some, as you mentioned, some adjustments, some uh, trying to compensate on ways of uh, connecting with people, trying to connect with people or trying to uh, understand the uh, nonverbal and non non communication and cues. So I was managing and then I moved to uh, the States after uh, I graduated college. So also there are a lot of things that I might have uh, that might have uh, helped me uh, understand the, what was uh, going on in my head and the neurodivergence and my neurodivergence were also complicated by uh, being in a different country with a slightly with a different culture, especially a place like uh, the Pacific Northwest, which are a little bit more, let's say, reserved, nicer on the outside, but not necessarily saying uh, what's going on, which are, and then. Of course, uh, to a certain degree, but not as much uh, as uh, I mean a lot of uh, other people because, uh, because I did grow up with uh, both like both English and Spanish growing up. Also, the cultural and uh, language uh, uh, variants. So after a few years uh, and a couple of uh, I'm going to say uh, incidents where I there were major miscommunications and the uh, stuff with the. Uh, that affected the relationship with some people or some uh, places. I, I mean, a friend uh, may have mentioned that. Hey, have you? Th are you in the spectrum? Have you thought about it? And even though it was something that was all in the back of my head, just uh, hearing it from someone else uh, made me wonder. And then it became sort of going to the forefront a little bit more in my. Uh, mind in the way that I approached uh, things. And then last year, uh, after talking to, with my partner and uh, stuff, I started actually seeking, a, as I mentioned, an official diagnosis, because I think it might help me uh, understand uh, myself a little bit better and how I process the world.
Thank you, Maria. Who'd like to answer next if one of the two of you would like to take that question? Yeah, yeah. Or both. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Jay, do you want to go? No. no, ladies first. Okay, okay. Well, that's so kind. Uh, yeah, I mean, similarly, similarly, I feel like, what, is there like a gifted kids alumni survivor club <laughs> hello we're all members right you know <laughs> right right <Yep. laughs> um no doubt. yeah yeah so i mean i would say that my journey to diagnosis was really interesting i mean again because like we already know the gender disparities when it comes to both to um, be diagnosed with various like neurodivergent conditions everything from adhd to autism and so on and so forth anyway and so um what I think is interesting is, is that like I didn't like think that neurodivergency was a thing until last year. But what's interesting now, as I was like, this has been my entire life. Why did no one say anything? Mm -hmm. I think it's because again, like I was a girl. Um, and so my um like my condition like uh manifested very differently and so like they were used to the whole like young boys jumping off the wall type situation um as an example or like looking at how folks interact in social situations but again i'm socialized very very differently as a woman anyway and like for me it, i didn't have a lot of that hyperness but like hyperfixation as an example <laughs> that, that my entire life and like it's gotten to the point where like in high school as an example um i was in six ap classes out of seven and the seventh was speech and debate um i was in eight student organizations i was the president of four of them i worked two jobs and then as, as well as i played softball and did theater all at the same time anyway and everyone was just like oh tara has a superpower tara just has a superpower yeah it's called hyperfixation and adhd <laughs> <laughs> that's what it's called <laughs> anyway um but still like it didn't like register but what's interesting is like in regards to like my specific community um so like I'm sure we've all heard the stereotype about how natives are all stoic that ain't true don't be telling nobody that um but within my family though which really <laughs> ever since i was a child my grandma always liked to tell me that um i was different than the rest of them didn't really know what that quite meant, but like it was, it's very true. Um, like even just like looking at my immediate family, you know, we like to joke that the black sheep is me. <laughs> um, but you know, like in the, in a different sense of like how people typically like, you know, say someone says a black sheep, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, um, but yeah, so now we go to 2020. Oh, 2020, it's a year, you know, it's still a panini, <laughs> we were there. Um, and so I was like on Twitter and what I noticed is, is that like some of these like symptoms just really exacerbated during the pandemic, because I think over the past like 27 years, I've just gotten to the point where like I know how to manage um, how my brain works and like what I need. I've like built all of these different support systems in like um strategies that i do just and have done since i was a child but then all of a sudden being uprooted to working at home in isolation because like even as like an artist like i need to go work at a panera i need all these constant voices happening and like i can't just like play a youtube video or music like it needs to be actual physical people anyway well that was all gone now and i realized that like I was struggling with executive dysfunction, which wasn't really that big of an issue for me before. Um, object permanence got real bad. My poor partner, bless him, he was like, why can't you take the bathroom trash out? I was like, it's behind a cabinet. I can't see it, it's dead to me. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, um, and so in August of 2020, um, I went to my doctor and this was after I was on Twitter and there was a lot of like um, ADHD and autism accounts. And I was like, I'm identifying a little bit too much. <laughs> these accounts uh and i was like and then something just clicked i was like this this makes some sense um and so for healthcare i use indian health services so it is really beneficial that my doctors were all native and so like i didn't have that additional barrier of like medical racism to get through and also like my doctor was also a woman and so i also didn't have that additional barrier of like oh no adhd is a little boy disease so they like to say mm, we all know we all know. Um, yeah, and so the diagnosis process came really, really quickly. And it was sort of just like, yeah, why didn't we know this the whole time? <laughs> and I was like, I don't know. 
anyway, uh, and so since August, it's been, um, I've just been doing my due diligence of learning more and more about it and like how it manifests and like all the different types and the combinations, et cetera, et cetera. And in that research, I'm learning more about autism because again, like it's so closely related. Um, and again, we're in that, we were in that situation like about a couple months ago. I was like, I'm identifying a little bit too much <laughs> with what I'm reading. Anyway, yeah, so we are currently exploring that diagnosis process uh, where we are in that, but we're very early in that. Um, so I will say I'll have some more in the next few months or so. Um, but yeah, that's sort of how my journey went, is going. Awesome, it went and is going. All right, Jay, why don't you hop on in? All right. Well, uh, I think that we've beaten the whole gifted child thing to death. <laughs> so I'll just, I'll just glance on over that. But uh, no, in all seriousness, uh, I was very different as a child. I was very, very sensitive to my surroundings and uh, I didn't really understand how I was different. And then I was majorly depressed as a child, going back as literally as long as I can remember, but I didn't receive the official diagnosis of major depression until I was in my 20s. And then in my 30s, my late 30s, I had a depressive episode which led to a suicide attempt. And after that, there was a hearing as to whether or not I would be put on disability. And the doctor for the other side actually agreed with our side. And that's when he gave me the di diagnosis of PDD NOS. And so I've been carrying that around since I was 37 or so. And then just last year, I was 44, 45. And uh, we're watching something on the television. And it's about autism. And it just made me go, wow, am I autistic too? And my partner at the time said, yes. Not, not even missing a beat, just like, yes. I'm like, you answered that quickly. And she's like, well, didn't you say you had PDD NOS? I'm like, is that autism? So sure enough, I had been diagnosed with autism and nobody told me. You know, that's so, that's so it's, it's so interesting that you mentioned that because it's like, um, I think about how um, in the DSM-5 for a lot of, you know, in the United States for a long time now, you know, the diagnosis that people get, like for example, my diagnosis, I got under DSM-5, so it's autism spectrum disorder, which I don't like just the term disorder. It's just, it's conditioned to I me, mean, I'm not disordered. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think about my children were right. diagnosed a little bit earlier than I was. And so there's still, we were still transitioning out of DSM-4. So they have autistic disorder. And then, you know, my friend's son who was diagnosed at a similar time has like you, pervasive developmental disability, non or what I specialized, in, you know, specified, I'm sorry. And then there's the Asperger's. And so we know all that it's a spectrum and that all of us are unique and different, but it's really interesting that it seems for a long time there was, it, it was, there was, people have had this way of almost kind of separating or distancing um, people from their diagnosis when they share about it. So when they tell the parents, I've seen people who said that they have an Asperger's diagnosis, I'm thinking, but Asperger's is only supposed to be diagnosed if you had no speech delay or communication differences and you said you didn't speak till you were four. How are you Asperger's, you know, or whatever, uh, mm -hmm. or how they mention it almost kind of like passing because it's almost like stigmatizing. And so it's really interesting, you know, listening to the correlations between all of our stories and just thinking about, you know, all of us being involved in some capacity in things that we can perseverate on and we can hyper-focus on, um, you know, it's mm. almost kind of like using our neurology to an advantage to benefit us. And then we've all, you know, there's been some discussion of kind of like the cultural aspects as well. And so I'd love to hear um, you all share some things about, a few of you touched on it, about it a bit, but kind of like your life, your background, your neurology, your culture, all, how do those things all intermingle? Because like, you know, like sometimes they intermingle in a way that's really nice and sometimes they they clash like oil and water, you know, like I think about myself, for example, um, being West African, even though I was raised here in the United States, the eye contact thing, my parents did not care. They, in fact, they were happy 
that I didn't make um, eye contact because that's like rude. They always thought Americans were just so rude, just directly looking at folks in their face, you know, like no type of reverence. Mm. And so looking away was seen as being, you know, being reverent and paying attention and being cool, being able to, to entertain myself for long periods of time. They were glad they didn't have to entertain me. Good. She's independent. She can line things up. She can read. She can do things on her own. Cool. Awesome. Um, I spoke, I wasn't very subtle. I spoke things that I didn't mean to say that I, you know, were when people had colloquial, you know, well, I'm not sorry, rhetorical questions, things that I didn't realize they wanted answers to, but they just chalked that off to a cultural difference. Okay, well, maybe she doesn't know that you're not supposed to say this or do this. So some of those things were beneficial. They didn't want a big deal, you know, for my, but then other things were like being, you know, my culture, a lot of get togethers that people like to have are loud and demonstrative and big. And I'm a, a combination of a sensory seeker and an avoider. So sometimes those things are great for me. And sometimes those things are torture. Um, or the foods. Mm -hmm. We've got amazing foods, amazing music. But sometimes it's a sensory overload, overwhelm. Mm. You know, I think things like that. So I just think about, and then being here, um, li living in America. Um, and so being amongst my you know, peers who are African-American, and that's my culture too, because that's where I live. Um, you know, and looking at some of the things that were, that I saw as traits that I really admired in like black women that I didn't feel like I could do. Like I didn't have the, I couldn't, you know, the, the, the vibrance and the creativity and all that people seem to have, I just seemed like a step behind all the time. I was like, mm, I feel like such a fake black woman, you know what I mean, type of thing. So it's interesting how these different, and then even people would tell me, oh, you talk like a white girl, which I'm clearly not mm -hmm. white. How does a white girl talk? Mm -hmm. But again, the, the way that the, you know, that you communicate sometimes as a person who's neurodivergent can be different. So be curious to hear from you all how these things kind of intersect in your lives. Well, I get that I talk like a white guy all the time. I do. Uh, <laughs> I wanted, actually, I wanted to ask you, you said that uh, part of your heritage is, is Cape Verdean. Do you yes. pronounce it Manchupa or Kachupa? Yeah. Oh, so unfortunately, I only speak English. So when we were little, we lived in Nebraska, and my brother um, was learning Portuguese as well as Arabic and Yoruba from my family's mm -hmm. culture. And, and my older brother is dyslexic, but nobody knew that at the time. So when he was having difficulty in school, the teachers pulled my parents aside and said, you're ruining his life. Why are you speaking all these languages to him? He's confused. All these other kids in the class are on par. He's not because he's confused. And they were like, well, we want him to know our culture. They're like, well, then he's going to do really badly in, in, you know, in school. You need to, and so it was mm. horrible. Like he would speak to them and they were told to ignore him unless he spoke English. Like they'd ask them a question. They would just look away like he didn't even speak. And he's a little boy. He's crying. And then he would tug on their shirt and ask again if he said it in English. So by the time I was, oh, came around, you, you know, it was already understood you speak only English in the house. So I, it's mm. very sad for me because I feel like it's a, it's a huge sense of my uh, culture that's been lost that, you know, for myself and my children children that I, you know, I care about deeply. And I think there's a lot of misunderstanding. It, the research that came out later was that the more language you speak to child, the better. The plasticity of the brain allows them to pull together multiple languages and thrive. It was just that he yes. didn't, they didn't realize it was dyslexia at the time. And that's why they came to America for a better life education. So it's mm. just interesting how sometimes just thinking about what Tara said about the stoic aspect, you know, like the kind of the jokes, but some of these things, these, these um, stereotypes, even when they're um, you know, seen as favorable ones, they can really harm people, you know, quite a bit. So like yeah. that, I should be able to answer that question. <laughs> yeah. No, it just, I had a, I had a similar instance as far as the culture not being severely indoctrined into the family, but except for the food. And so that's why I was asking, because I get people, I get people all the time. I say Manchupa, but some people say Kachupa. I wrote a poem called Kachupa for a couple of my other Cape Verdean friends. And uh, I was just wondering about that. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, no, I, well, growing up in a predominantly white neighborhood in a predominantly white city, uh, I did get the education that provided me with the ability to speak what I would b until now call properly. I'm starting to learn that there are uh, other ways that should be acceptable to speak. But uh, yeah, I would get all the time that you talk like a white guy, you sound like a white guy. I'm like, no, but okay. And uh, 
I would just I would just deal with it because like I said, my except for the food, my culture was not handed to me. I learned most of what I know about Cape Verde from my college professors. Yeah, I'd love to hear from Mario or, or, or Tara because it's like, you know, I'm getting emotional because I'm just thinking about the first time I'm, that I had someone tell me that, you know, you don't pronounce your name right. And I was like, I know my name, Marenike, it's Yoruba. They're like, no, it's pronounced like this. And I was like, wow, I've been pronouncing it wrong my whole life. But I'm like, wow, I just felt like such an imposter. So it's just, you know, but again, some of that is, again, the neurology piece, too. So Mario, please continue. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's, I think, for lack of a better word, also, because I have an engineering background, I, I use the word interesting to describe things that aren't necessarily good. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, so different because, I mean, I have, a, like, me, like, uh, and I think I would, so would say, like, a, a lot of uh, people who uh, migrated or moved from one country or culture to another, like, this uh, shift, where so I like, did grow up in a, in a country where I would be uh, on the more privileged uh, side. Uh, I looked like people, I had uh, the uh, clear skin. I, so I had that and then moved here to the States where, I mean, up until I, until I opened my mouth, I could pass for a white person for the most part, but then I opened my mouth and then like things change. But also, because even the same, so of how, how my brain works, uh, I mean, also, I think I was uh, not going to say able to, but uh, I think I was oblivious enough that I actually did miss a lot of uh, micro and macro aggressions that happened. Uh, both, uh, because of, I have an accent, I, I do, don't come from, uh, not from the, uh, not from the country, though. I don't share that I'm technically both an immigrant, third generation and fourth generation and fifth generation American. Because, you know, Im immigration is complicated. People, people's lives are complicated. But, uh, mm. so it wasn't until I, I was actually consciously making an effort to understand the, who I am, what I, both in terms of uh, uh, how my brain works, how, what I look like, what my culture is, uh, and also in comparison to a place like Seattle or that I started going, oh, oh, there's a lot going on that I'm just uh, able to realize it. And then having a, like the uh, opportunity to go back and forth between uh, uh, places where I'm part of the, uh, my, of the uh, majority culture, but then going back to a place where I wasn't and then moving uh to somewhere like providence where it's uh actually the, f the first time that i came to providence looking for an apartment uh i get, got out of the train station and the first uh, conversation that i hear was in spanish because as, as it turns out uh and i found out this later for example uh, providence is uh 43 percent of people in providence are Latin latinx or come from a latina background and then uh there's towns in uh, here in Rhode Island that's, uh, that are up to 70% uh, Latino or Latinx. Uh, so it's uh, just feeling like the differences between uh, how people see or not. And then for me, that really made me start really wondering more about, uh, the, as you were saying, like the things that we hide uh, or that are, uh, that we, uh, 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 let's say, uh, not, not adjudicate, but uh, attribute to uh, that because that's our culture, that's a, a language thing, or that's a, a gender thing, or that's a, a, the uh, well, that weird thing that uh, that Mario does. 
<laughs> it's so interesting, um, and Tara, I want, really want to hear yours you, about, you know, mentioning, like you said, Oklahoma is complex. And so I really mm. would love, really, really want to hear your take on this, but I just want to comment quickly on something that, you know, both of you said. So, you know, Jay, it's interesting, you're like, you know, like the whole thing about people saying you speak like a white person, like, you know, as if there's one way to speak like a white person. <laughs> and, um, and then Mario, what you were mentioning, it's like interesting, I think, depending on upon where a person lives, like thinking about myself having, you know, in my younger years, we lived in the Midwest, but I, you know, did my college years in, in California. I live in Texas now. And so here, you know, someone would immediately would not, you wouldn't, you know, because of the fact that we are accustomed to having, you know, a huge Latinx population and so forth, people would say, oh, okay, you know, they would look at you and they would assume that you, you know, even again, there's no one way to look like you're from anywhere. But because of the fact that there's, you know, a large group of people here, people are accustomed to seeing people who are Desi or who are Vietnamese or who are whatever, whereas there's certain groups we're not accustomed to seeing at all. And so people get confused, you know, mm -hmm. by that, you know, like we have, you know, a much smaller, for example, indigenous population here than in other, in, in states that are very close to us and there's a lot less known about that so it's just really fascinating how people forget about like there's like you mentioned um immigration and all of that is complicated it's not just linear and then there's also the ethnicity piece you know because you know you know in terms of the differences there and with even within one language like you said um, yes. here. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, I can go. I can go off. What's funny is whenever I'm not in Oklahoma, no one knows I'm indigenous. They're all just like, oh, Latina. And I was like, no. Anyway, but uh, in regards to this question, like around like culture and community, um, what's really interesting for the community that I was raised in is, is that disability and like neurodivergence is seen as a very colonial thing. And what I mean by that is not that it doesn't exist, but it's this whole need to have a delineation for something that's just so natural to people is, colo is inherently colonial because like it's a, about assigning value to people and where they fall in this hierarchy of white supremacy and colonization. Anyway, and so whereas for the people that I'm from, because I have a lot of disabled relatives. However, we don't talk about disability. There's no talk about disability justice because each individual person is a relation and we provide what each person needs like the end <laughs> like there's no talk about like oh we have to make sure that this place is you know ada compliant that it's accessible this that, and the other because they just already are it's just a given these things are provided and so i think that's also like contributes to i mean on top of the socialization of being a woman but i think like also contributed to, to like why i didn't just put two and two together very very early um because y'all we don't been like this as we know and um and yeah and then but like even when like i've even noticed as a child even the now uh is whenever i'm in other spaces with other native people it's very very clear that i'm very very different <laughs> from just like how we interact socially and like it's like no one ever says anything other than they laugh that um i'm probably like the most outgoing native person they know and that i speak really quickly and that's very very different <laughs> i'm probably the fast talking native out there for the most part anyway um yeah and so it was just like this given of just like oh yeah no she's just she's just, she's just different but it's fine that's just how it is and so that's why i didn't like again, like come to understanding the diagnosis sooner played a huge, huge role in it. And then as well as just like this socialization throughout school, because I moved from um, Seminole Nation into the big city in Oklahoma, and then went to a school where I was the only native person. Um, even though I lived in like a predominantly black and brown neighborhood, I go to school and it's a predominantly white school because of just how they drew the lines. It, I, it makes no sense. Anyway, and then I get sent to speech classes um, and I, this was sort of like a recent realization because um, I remember going to speech classes, but I didn't know why, because like I've been talking for, <laughs> forever. I learned to read at two and a half. So like, I was just really curious, like why was I in speech classes? And so I asked my dad about it and he was like, oh, they said it was because you were kept, speak, kept going out between English and Muskogee. Um, and so they sent you to speech classes so you would just speak English. And then also you were just speaking too fast. And so they sent me to speech classes to slow down my speech. This is why I think I have a Southern accent, honestly. I think I blame that. Um, but that happened throughout my entire elementary school experience. And part of that came with the socialization of like how I was supposed to act, not just as like a young girl, but a young girl of color anyway. And so 
yeah, it was just like drastically different from like how it was at home and within my community versus it was at school. And so I felt very early on, like, right like that masking. I was just like, well, this is how we are here. And then this is how we are somewhere else. And then that's how just we're going to get by. Um, yeah, and I'm still like continuously working on that now of just like, well, how can we just be and continue to like what is true and authentic to my community, which is just existing as a relation, um, not existing within these colonial frameworks and these caste systems that were thrust upon my people we did not sign up for. Um, yeah, so that's like whenever I think about like that culture and the intersection, it's really what I think about. Um, he's like even growing up knowing um, other natives with disabilities like I have a nephew who uh, is also autistic and like again his entire experience there was nothing like oh oh we gotta you know we gotta be careful with Dakota Dakota's different Dakota's special Dakota has special needs oh my god I'm, gonna get I'm sure we all feel the same <laughs> but that anyway like there was no like differentiation between Dakota it was just like cool well Dakota's Dakota and this is another cousin, and this is another kid. Great. Anyway, and it's just, oh, Dakota needs to go to his room sometimes. Great, cool, bye. Anyway, he'll be back when he wants to. Um, and like that sort of it. Like, so it's like a very normalized experience. And so like, yeah, it's just very interesting now, especially like having the diagnoses and knowledge th that I do now, because I already knew it was a thing, but now I have that language of like why it is so different outside of home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think that, uh, I mean, there were a couple of things that came to my mind when, as you were telling, sharing that. Uh, one is that I, I think in many ways I'm uh, like uh, Dakota because things like, because uh, in family gatherings or dinners that we have uh, with uh, more of our extended family, I don't know that uh, I would eventually go, or I need to go out uh, to, to my room or somewhere else just to uh, get away from people and just be by myself, recharge. And for a long time, I was just think, hey, it's just uh, that I'm uh, really introverted, that I just need to uh, recharge those batteries, instead of thinking, oh, it's probably somewhere, something else going on there. And that also led me to think that uh, it's uh, how it's interesting, I, again, interesting, in engineer mm -hmm. uh, and theater maker. Uh, how uh, different cultures and both intercultural and intercultural uh, interactions can either mask or, let's say, really put us a, uh, a magnifying glass on something. So for uh, on disability and uh, neurodivergence. Because, so for example, for me, a lot of the way that I communicate, that I make conversations, so is that I, I, for me, I need to wait until the uh, person that I'm talking to finishes speaking, maybe wait a second or two to see if there it was just a breath or if they're going to go on and then I can talk because it's my turn. And but then a lot of uh, different people, different cultures, even no matter where you're at, there's uh their way of communicating is uh, more overlapping. There's a uh, and for me that's uh a little, for example, overwhelming. And there's a little, all right, what, hey, Mary, why are you so quiet? Because I, because you're talking, there's no space for me to uh, come on in. And then there's, uh, it, it, you know, of course, it gets even more complicated because uh, when sometimes when I go on and do interrupt, I also may go, oh, wait, I'm just uh, starting to talk over uh, or interrupting. Uh, Oh, because again, uh, I'm a, if I, I'm a man. If I also, if I start interrupting and realize that I will sometimes over uh, interrupt or start talking over uh, women or other pe or other people that I have also have that 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 culturally get uh, that uh, interrupted and don't get heard, it's. Uh, uh, I don't know exactly where I'm going with this, except with it's complicated. All the intersectionalities uh, that uh, are in everyone's lives are, I mean, affect every part, uh, every part of our lives. And I think it's a part of the thing that we need to all be mindful. And that's something that I don't need to tell any one of you because you all live that every day. Yeah. 
Yes. It's um, brilliant what you said about how sometimes just the over the different communication styles can present a certain way. So if you, you know, if your tone is, you know, elevates or it gets quieter, or if you info dump or if you cut in, it may be seen as rudeness, you know, or if you're, or in your case, you're waiting respectfully for someone to finish and it may seem like you're disinterested or don't want to engage when it's not that at all. And so all of these things get kind of, you know, and then wanting, like you're mentioning, to be mindful of the fact that, you know, you're, you're trying to be respectful of some of the experiences that you understand that people have and, and bring that into the conversation in terms of not interrupting so that there's not an, uh, you know, an unintentional microaggression that might be perceived. It's, it's just fascinating. And so I have more questions, but I'm not just enjoying talking to y'all. So I'm actually going to throw this tablet down. And for our last <laughs> few minutes, I really just want you all to share what you, uh, you know, anything that comes to your heart or your thought, you know, like a lot of you shared a lot of things, like for example, Jay, Mario, Ontario, you all mentioned about how life worked until it didn't and then it fell apart. And I think we've all, whether it was the pandemic or whether it was when, you know, with the, the periods of major depression or Mario, the relationships or communications that kind of went awry and I've had similar circumstances in my life too. And so mm -hmm. there's that piece. I know some of you have mentioned like your partners, um, kind of being like, yeah, that's kind of you, you know, like the things that we can't always see because we're, we're here, this is our lives, this is what we know. And so, yeah. I mean, there's just so much here and I just really want to just give you all the floor to, you know, share anything that you think that for the people, you know, watching and or listening to this or reading the transcript or captions, what they, you know, something that would be good for them to take away. Hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, one one of the f first things that I uh, so I met Clay Martin the uh, artist director of Spectrum Theater last year, and one of the first things that uh, he said, and that I actually uh, I've really taken to heart is that uh, that that I think it's uh, useful. I mean, I mean it's been useful for me is uh, that he said that. Uh, if you've met one uh, neurodiverse person, you've met one neurodiverse person, that everyone is different, even though for example, we might share a quote-unquote diagnosis. Our brain, we're different people. Our brains work differently. It's, and it's not necessarily a, a disability the way that we think about it. It might be simply a different way of uh, processing and accessing the world. And I mean, in a, lot, a lot of times it does need a, mean that we need uh, certain support systems or certain uh, accommodations that uh, other people don't. So it's not a good thing, or it's not a bad thing, it's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. I think what I'll add um, that I really want folks to walk away with is, is that setting up accommodations so that everyone can succeed is not fucking hard. You do it. You don't know how to do it. Step one, you listen and you do what you're told. Anyway, like that's been my biggest thing because recently because I am like the most productive from like 9 p.m. to 4 a.m. Because Twitter is quiet, my cats are sleeping, like everything is quiet and so I'm able to do things. And yet I'm also expected to be at 8 a.m. meetings. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> anyway, and so just like really reimagining what accommodations could look like, as well as like access check-ins, like asking folks to check in for their access needs takes an additional 30 seconds of introductions and of time. It's not difficult at all. Like that's the moral story. Um, I lied. I think the morally actual story is, is that everything that we're talking about and like advocating for, there are disability justice advocates who are predominantly black indigenous and of color who can lead the way who've already figured this shit out so like we ain't reinvent no wheels not at all so if you ever feel as though like you don't know what to do how do i make sure i make it an inclusive environment la, 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 la. number one like talk to people and also like number two know that there are so many free resources out there um written by people who this is their lived experience that you can just do as you're told it's really simple. Also, spoiler, this is my takeaway for literally every topic, whether it's about decolonization, whether it's about anti-racism, so on and so forth, is that there are people who know how to do it and have been doing it, so follow their lead and stop trying so fucking hard. It's really not hard. <laughs> anyway, Jay, what about you? Well, I, I definitely agree as far as 
formal kind of official organizations are concerned but when you're dealing with just person to person stuff it it does get a little more complicated only because every person is different you know like clay martin says you meet one autistic person you've met one autistic person but that can be said of any person you know you so every every body is going to have different ways of communicating and those ways aren't always going to mesh you know sometimes those ways will clash you know i had an argument with somebody recently over whether or not i snapped at people regarding a certain subject i'm like i didn't snap at anybody there was no attitude and they're like yeah you did you did snap you snapped no i i didn't and so there are going to be those times where things just clash and you have to learn to be more accepting of those times and understand that it's not anything wrong with you per se it's just the things don't match mm-hmm. yeah and uh, if i can go again <laughs> uh also i would like to add that uh, as if uh, for us for people listening watching that i'd like to remind that you cannot take things in isolation you cannot talk about a disability or neurodivergence and try to address it without realizing that there's a lot of other factors in play. For example, if we cannot talk about a disability or neurodivergence without talking about a race and the history of a colonization and the humanization that, for example, that has existed in this country and how that has, how that has affected how uh, people of color, especially, you know, black people, native people, have, have suffered and not have have access to the same uh, support systems that uh, other people have. You cannot be an organization that claims to su- support uh, neurodiversity if you only aim and serve the, the the people that already has access have access to the uh, to those systems to those support systems. You need to do the work and actually outreach uh, to. Uh, communities that don't speak English, communities that don't look like you, communities that uh, have, have, you know, oppression shoved down their throats for years. And yeah, so it's a, uh, if you think about one thing, you need to think about everything as a whole. It's, uh, mm. And also, if you're white and listening, we don't need a uh, you to save us we, we just need you to be there for us and sometimes just let us do our thing mm. yes we do not need the great white hope you're <laughs> welcome beside us as allies we don't need you in front of us we need you beside us or behind us while we lead our movements you're absolutely important and you have you know as again especially we, we all like it all people have privileges and marginal marginalizations so you might not be a person of color but maybe your neurology or your gender or your sexuality or a number of things could have you in, in you know circumstances your religion where you are marginalized we get that um but we can't but the erasure of the racial piece um, does a huge disservice to all of us, not just to those of us who are BIPOC, but to our community at large. And so this is so wonderful, but I know we all need to eat. So I want to ask if you all would share I mean, any closing remarks and then how people can reach you if they want to find out more about your work or, or follow you or learn more about you. Um, if you all don't mind sharing that before we close. Sure, sure. My Twitter's popping. So you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Tara Tomahawk, all one word. Uh, my website's terramoses.com. Um, yeah, that's where you can find me. And yeah, no, I don't have anything in, say, in closing. What's been said has already been said. I agree. Uh, and go ahead. Uh, go, go ahead, Jay. <laughs> um, I was going to say I'm also on Twitter a lot. A lot, a lot. And uh, my handle is jbird underscore 
Walker. And you have to spell out Jaybird, not the letter J, J A Y, like as in naked as a Jaybird, <laughs> which I'm almost, but not quite embarrassed to say how appropriate that is. But uh, so I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook. My artistic page is Jaybird Walker on FB. And uh, my website isn't ready yet. So <laughs> I'm not going to give that address. But, yeah, we totally uh, all, understand, but find Jay on Twitter and Facebook and you'll be able to get to the to the website. And, and um, Tara, so it's Tara Tomahawk spelled the same way your name is spelled, T-A-R-A, -A, right? Okay, just wanted people to know. And Maria? All right, well, uh, my uh, personal, well, personal slash professional website is uh, marioagomez.com. Uh, uh, you can uh, also, I guess, spoiler alert, I'm also right now the... Uh, serving as executive director for STE. So you can find me at mario at steensemble.org. And uh, at the moment, I will say, don't look me up on Twitter because all you'll find of, for me from me are uh, uh, tweets to uh, companies that ha weren't, hadn't responded to me with customer service. So I needed to do something a little bit more public. <laughs> so, so, so you'll see me asking uh, Sipcar, American Airlines, and uh, can't remember who the last one is about uh, something that happened that I hadn't heard back from them. Mm. So neurodivergent, like that's so real. <laughs> Um, and you can find me, well, my um, website is Mer my first name and then my last initials. So Morena KGO, spelled like more Nike than geo.com. I'm on Twitter also, and my usage is sporadic. Sometimes I'm on there like retweeting everything I see, and then sometimes I don't touch it for weeks. But on Twitter, I'm at Morena KGO. So again, M O R E N I K E G O. And then so we have um, Tara is at Tara Tomahawk. Was there an underscore or was it all one word? All right, so I'll, I'm at Tara Tomahawk, all one word, and at J underscore, was it P Bird? No, J Bird underscore oh Walker. <laughs> ADHD, y'all, sorry. J Bird sorry. spelled out with not just yes. J, but J A Y, Bird underscore Walker. And then um, Mario has given you um, his website and has shared with you that he is the ED of SE. And so you'll be able to follow his work here. Um, and I hope that you follow ST's work in general and the rest of this Neurodiversity Matters Conference. <laughs> You all, thank you so much for this this amazing panel. I could listen to y'all talk all day, but we promised that we'd end so we could go eat. <laughs> so I'm going <laughs> to let us close out. I just want to thank Teddy and everyone for for um, hosting, the, you know, for putting this panel together. And um, this is an important topic, and we're just grateful and hope to continue working together. And and hope that you all look out for some of these different resources and you know live, learn, and grow and continue making our community better. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.